welcome to LA Ram Central. No, you are not seeing a doppelganger. This is what I look like without all of the madness on the face. This is episode 51, and we are going to get this party started in grand old fashion. So, essentially, what we're going to do this week is a much speedier version of what we've done in the past. So, Eric and I are going to review the games first, and then I'm going to talk about the Ram game we both are in some detail. And then we're going to review what we think is going to happen this week. And, of course, we will end with the Rams and the um, San Francisco 49ers Thursday night game. So, Eric, I want you to go ahead and start from the top. Go ahead and do the Houston-Cincinnati game. Quick overview. All right. Well, the Houston-Cincinnati game wasn't all that was cracked up to be. Uh, Houston did enough to win the game. Cincinnati did quite a bit to not win. Uh, in hindsight, Cincinnati felt 0-2. Uh, A.J. Green is already calling out the offense to get in the ball more. Uh, Deshaun Watson did just enough on a long touchdown run that was the only touchdown for the game for either either team. And Cincinnati has yet to score a touchdown this season in eight quarters. So what do they do? They fire their offensive coordinator. It tends to have easy. Cincinnati's looking for an identity right now. And Marvin Lewis may be finally on the hot seat uh, out there in uh, in Cincinnati. Um, uh, I mean, it wasn't the greatest game to watch. Uh, Tech, uh, Houston was kind of bland on offense. Cincinnati didn't do anything on offense. So it was, it, was, it was your typical Thursday night game that that was just it. I mean, it was a typical Thursday. I thought Cincinnati would come out playing better. Um, they ended up playing worse than I thought they were going to. So it is really nothing to take away from that except that Houston's defense was good. And they're going to do just enough on offense to, to keep, keep, uh, keep themselves in the game with Watson at the helm. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think Watson's going to be fine, and, and I think, you know, even I'm calling for him to be on the hot seat at this point. You've, you've, been in the, you've been in Cincinnati long enough. It's time to start winning some playoff games, and you can't even win the first two games. you got a problem. Um, the one that I want to cover is the Baltimore-Cleveland game. Uh, Cleveland looked really good, but what I took away from this game was that Baltimore looks as real as they did a week before. And I think it's tough to look at Baltimore and go, they're you know they're going to be a really good football team this year because I mean Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Jacksonville don't seem like they're three strong opponents. But to be totally fair, I did have Cincinnati pick to win the division, and now it looks like they're going to be the strongest team in the division because they're going to be the ones holding everybody up. But in other words, they're in last place. You couldn't figure that out. But I mean, it looks like Baltimore is going to be just as good as you know as as everyone is used to seeing, which is a little bit of a surprise. But I did see improvement from Cleveland. And, you know, at this point, people need to start asking the question, where is Miles Garrett? Um, because I understand you've got an ankle injury, but you were the number one overall pick and you can't even get on the field yet to start the season due to injury. That's a little alarming in my book, but that's just me. Uh, Buffalo, Carolina. Um, one last thing on the Baltimore game. I think Flacco's proving how good of a quarterback he is. He's not, a, he's not a manager of the game. He's just a really good quarterback that knows how to convert third down and keep the, dry, the chains moving. If he can run the rock, run it till they stop it. So I like the direction Baltimore's going, and we'll get to where they should be at the end here in a little bit. Buffalo, Carolina, for me, was a really good game, Eric. It was an old-fashioned 1980s-style beatdown football game. And what I liked about it was you had two teams that weren't giving ground. You had two teams that were running the ball. You had two teams that were trying to throw the ball. At times, a passing game looked painful, but I think overall it was more defensive scheme than anything else. I actually enjoyed the Carolina Buffalo game from a deep from a standpoint of I like low scoring, old school smash mouth football, and that's what this game was from beginning to end. Um, and I think Cam Newton looked really good, um, you know, when he needed to, and he looked he looked like he's still nursing an injury for sure. I can definitely see that. Um, of course, I've got to go next. Okay, so um, moving on to the Arizona Indy game. This is the one that I'm going to give a little more in-depth information on. So um, hold that thought real quick.
Okay. <clears throat> First of all, Eric, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Has anybody said the following statement following the Cardinals' victory that they really can't gauge it because they played a Pop Warner team? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how that only happens when the Rams beat the Colts, right? Um, if the Rams beat a Pop Warner team last week by 40-something points or damn near 40 something, 40 points, uh, I know the score was 46-9, to nine, so that's actually 35. I can do math. Um, what, does it, what does it mean when the NFL's darlings needed overtime to beat a bad football team? Yeah. Pretty, but it's a win. You know what? And here's my thinking. If you're going to look at, and, and we do this all the time in coaching, we look at a game and we say, okay, common opponents, how did they play against them versus us playing against them? And I'm telling you, Eric, there isn't a coach in the country at any level that doesn't do this. And when you look at common opponents and you go, they allowed 13 points and could only score 16. When we play that football team, we will pound them into, into the ground. We should win that football game. That's the mindset of a coach when you see common opponents and you blew them out and the other team struggled. The other thing is, I told you this last week, the mark of a good team is one who can blow out the bad opponents. Right? The Cardinals are not a good football team. They needed a miracle at the end of the game to beat them. And by miracle, I mean you know, a decent drive at least. Kick the game-tying field goal after missing one, by the way. Then they needed an interception in overtime to stop the Colts and then end up running a couple times in the middle and kicking the field goal and winning the game. Arizona cannot run the football. Carson Palmer is done. He's done. I'm calling it now. Stick a fork in him. He's done. He has nothing left. This is like watching... Michael Jordan on the Wizards, except he's not as good as Jordan ever was. But it's like watching, you know, uh, insert legend here that then just pfft, Peyton in 87. Maybe he should have retired in 86. But the problem is he was a good quarterback. He was never a great quarterback. And when his skills diminish, they diminish quickly. As opposed to a great athlete whose skills diminish, they diminish slowly. So... I wasn't impressed with the Cardinals' win. I thought it was a garbage win, and I'm looking at that going way to rep the AFC or the NFC West. It was a bad win, but a win is a win, and that's true. They're all one and one. I love how the, all the standings have the Cardinals in front, but when you do every tie-breaking matrix, the Rams should be in front of the Cardinals. But whatever, they're one and one. We know they're not going to end up that way. I just took three. And don't forget, and don't, and don't forget the Cardinals never led in the game at no. any point until the end. Until their final kick. Yep. I took three things away from that game. Their defense is good, but they're not as great as everyone's making them out to be. Their offense is really bad. And their offensive line cannot pick up um, a particular blitz package that we call a twist uh, linebacker stunt. And that's where your outside linebacker and your, in this case for the Rams, a 3-4 defense, their nose tackle, twist, meaning they switch. So one comes across the line into the outside and the outside linebacker loops in and comes right up through the A-gap. The Cardinals couldn't pick that up all game long. So I'm looking at this game going, you know, okay, the Cardinals get the win, but I think I feel worse about the Cardinals now than I did a week ago when they got beat up by the Detroit Lions. And they won this game. So it is possible to get worse in victory, and the Cardinals did that. What's your take? My take is the Cardinals aren't going anywhere this year. Yeah. And will Andrew Luck ever play this year for the Colts? Yeah. That's interesting. That's what I took away from that. Because Luck's already been ruled out for week three. So is it going to be a Jacoby Brissett show? Are they, you know, if they, if they don't play Luck at all this year, you know, they had that game wrapped up. They just had they needed one stop and they couldn't get it. But if they're going to not play luck at all, what happens if they get a top three pick? Do they trade luck? Do they draft the quarterback and then trade? So 
so they're kind of a wild card in all of this. Yeah. Like the Colts, the Colts aren't good enough to win. They're they're not they're not good enough to be competitive right now. They need luck on uh, to to carry that off. But T. Y. Hilton and Dante Moncrief are nothing without luck. Yeah. It's like what were what was Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison without Peyton? Not very good. Uh, but I, I I mean I don't mean to brag on the Colts, but I, I don't see anything to show where they're going to be competitive and they're going to be in line for the division. Yeah, oh, That's as far as I can go with that. Like, yeah, I mean, they're not, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're a wild card. Yeah, no, they're not even a wild card. I mean, they're not even close. To, well, I mean, they're like a wild card in top five picks. Yeah. But not wild card playoff wise. Right. All right, um... Tennessee at Jacksonville. Take it away, E. This is one of the games that uh, you're doing a quick blurb on. Yeah, the Tennessee-Jacksonville game. Jacksonville reverted back to themselves. Um, but what they look like in the preseason after having a, uh, after having a great game uh, down in Houston in week one. Um, Tennessee bounced back very nicely from losing to Oakland. Uh, put up 37 points uh, on Jacksonville. Uh, you know, DeMarco Murray went out with a little bit of a um, small injury, and, and Derrick Henry, look, Derek Henry looks really good. He, he looks ready to take over that uh, running back position there in Tennessee. Uh, Mariota was hitting his guys. I mean, you know, when you have when you have all the uh, weapons inside and outside for Tennessee, you know, you got to feed you got to feed the rock to everybody. Yeah. I mean. What can I say? You know, the Titans played a complete game against Jacksonville, and that's a way to step up and and go into Week Three uh, with your head uh, head held high. And Tennessee Tennessee is going to be tough out in the AFC. Yeah, the the game that I want to go into detail on because I watched it and I actually recorded it. I'm going to put it on DVD and keep it for my collection. Uh, Philadelphia Kansas City was um, not as good of a game as the score may have indicated. Um, although it became a better game when the Eagles recovered the onside kick, but you know they were back and forth. It was six three at halftime, and it was it looked a lot like the Buffalo Carolina game. It was just a really, it wasn't an ugly six three game. It was a really good six three game. Great defensive stops, big plays at the right time, drop passes in key moments. You know, great completions, and then drives get stalled later on. Um, smash mouth football, both teams trying to run the rock and it was looking like they were running into a brick wall. Great quarterback play, good decision making on when to throw it away. Um, I saw one play that Alex Smith made where he ran to his right, avoided the rush, started running towards a line of scrimmage, and then went to throw it and realized the safety was coming up over the top and then just threw it out of bounds. Like you saw him pump it and then throw it out like a quick little like forward shovel type of the situation. It was really impressive. And then Carson Wentz is just getting better each week. Um, and, and Philadelphia really showed up in the fourth quarter when the game should have been over. They flipped the script and they flipped the switch and kind of told Kansas City, we're not going to give up on this game like the Patriots did last week. We're going to finish this thing strong. And I think that's the reason why everyone was so shocked about New England's game last week is because it did seem like they just kind of tanked it in at the end of the fourth, you know, midway through the fourth quarter. Philly didn't do that here and that made the game even better. When they scored the touchdown, I'm like, whatever, touchdown in garbage time, boo, I hate that. But they kicked the onside, and they actually got it. And they got an opportunity to try to win the game at the end and um, or tie the game at the end, and it was just another great defensive stand at the end. So I took a lot of things away from this game. Number one, Kansas City's for real, and good luck beating them in Arrowhead. Number two, Philadelphia in defeat impressed me more this week than they did in victory last week. Um because they did it against a second straight good opponent. And I think Philadelphia might just, well, not might, they're definitely going to replace the Giants in my pick. Um, I'm Unfortunately, I made my picks. So I'm, I'm stuck to them. But I'm telling you right now, it's probably going to be Philly instead of New York in that, second, in that first wild card spot. Washington's kind of floating around. We'll get to them later. But I was impressed with Philly. And I was impressed with Kansas City. I was impressed with both teams. I thought it was a great game. Um, unless you want to add something, Eric, you've got, um, oh, New England, I'll jump to New England, New Orleans, unless you want to say something. Yeah, uh, one quick 
know, um, the Chiefs, they have a, they have a really, they're, they're getting a, a, a star running back in Kareem Hunt, and to do it two weeks in a row, everybody thought it might have been a fluke in week one. Yeah. But to do it against a tougher defense in Philadelphia, uh, Kareem Hunt, even though he had only had 81 yards rushing, he was still a major, a major factor in that game, and the Chiefs can rely on him going forward. Definitely, definitely. Um, New England, New Orleans, I just want to make one thing clear. Even though we both picked New Orleans, I think it's safe to say we were expecting like a 46-45 type of game, right, Eric? Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah. I didn't expect New England to lose this game and look as bad as they did against Kansas City. I expected their offense to excel, but the loss of Devontae Hightower costing New England in the end. But it didn't happen. Um, credit Bill Belichick as usual. Credit Tom Brady. Over 400 yards passing. I mean, the Patriots look like the person or the team everyone picked at the uh, outset of the season. So it's a good win, but it is against New Orleans, and they did only score 36 points against a bad defense. I, I am looking at that going, you know, that could be because of their weapons being gone, or that probably is because of their weapons being gone. I think New England is a tough team. I, I still making them to make the playoffs. I just don't think they're going to go in at 14 and 2, 13 and 3, or even 12 and 4. I think 11 and 5, 10 and, well, 11 and 5, 12 and 4 might be about where they end up. Um, And I just thought going on the road against New Orleans might be a little bit more difficult to do, but credit the Patriots organization. They do what they always do. They win the football game, and in the end, they won by 16 points. I mean, what else can you really say? Keep keep this stat in mind for the game, too, and I'll get back to it shortly. But Tom Brady, two carries for nine yards. Okay. I'll tell you how that's relevant coming up. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right, E, take it away. Minnesota at Pittsburgh. Do your quick blurb. All right, well, the game changed uh, for Minnesota once once Sam Bradford was declared out. Um, for those that, that watched last week's show, uh, yes, I did pick Minnesota because I thought Bradford uh, would play. Um, Sunday morning, I texted Anthony. I said, I'm changing my pick to the Steelers. Why? They're going to load up the box, they're going to stop Dalvin Cook, and they're going to make Case Keenum beat them. And that's exactly what they did. They used their stifling defense, and Pittsburgh came out. Roethlisberger had, you know, an okay game, uh, 243 yards passing. Bell was all right on the ground, still hasn't broken out yet. And, and Bryant actually led the receivers in, uh, in receiving yards of 91. Um, so it, it, it was interesting to see that Minnesota not able to score double-digit points. And, you know, I know sometimes it's hard to go into Pittsburgh, but when you're doing it with a backup quarterback, that's not a recipe for success. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it was an easy Pittsburgh win in my book. Definitely. Um, okay, you're up again. Um, you've got your boys against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, one team uh, showed up to play that game, and it, it looked like the, uh, the Bears were the road weary team that was off all off season and came back uh, to see you know hurricane damage. Um, they looked like they were damaged by a hurricane. Um, yeah, they were. Really fresh. Hurricane Winston. Uh, Winston. Winston was able to get uh, Rogers uh, feed Rogers the ball, uh, get to, get the ball to his boy Evans. Um, they. Tampa had a great defensive game plan, you know, make Mike, make Mike run and beat them. He ended up throwing a pick six. They had three turnovers in the first half, and at halftime, it was 26 to nothing. So when you're already that down in a hole at halftime, you know, there's there's really nothing you can do. The, the Bears are just ravaged with injuries. And I'm not making an excuse because Baltimore's had a lot more injuries than their 2-0. Uh, the Cardinals with David Johnson is out for – eight weeks or so, um, so that's not an excuse. They won. Uh, the, the Bears just don't have any playmakers. Tampa Bay is loaded with playmakers. Um, they got one more week without uh, Doug Martin, and then he comes back. But Jackson on one side, Evans on another, and then great, even O.J. Howard uh, as tight ends. They're, they're going to be a tough team. I know you're not high on this year, Anthony, but and I know it was only against the Bears. But I think Tampa, I think Tampa's going to make some noise in that NFC South. We'll see. I mean, I've been wrong before, so um, I mean, I picked the Rams to make the playoffs last year too. Remember? Just calm down on that. All right. I mean, it, I could be wrong, so I just don't see it. 
Miami at the Chargers. Um, loved every frigging minute of this game. I don't think Jay Cutler's wife was a bigger fan of Jay Cutler than every single Ram fan watching this game. Um, Cutler played well, made some good decisions, made some typical Cutler decisions, but didn't throw that crucial pick six like you thought he was going to do. Parkey was putting it's coming. <laughs> well, maybe, but it didn't happen this week, and that's all I care about. I don't give a flying fart about the next few weeks. I just didn't want Miami to lose to San Diego. And you know, what I liked about this game was Miami ran the ball well, they converted third downs, and they did something, and this is where I really am starting to become a huge fan of the Miami Dolphins head coach. Um, now I'm spacing his name, and I sound like I totally don't even know what I'm talking Adam about. Gase. Thank you, Adam Gase. The reason I'm start, starting to become a big fan of Adam Gase is he does utilize that Joe Gibbs mentality of don't chase points. Get them where you can get them and then worry about touchdowns in the second half. He had opportunities to go for it on fourth and really short and keep the drive alive and try to go for the touchdown, and he kicked the field goal every single time in the first half. And then the second half, he's like, well, we're just going to keep playing the field goal game because, you know, it's working. But more importantly, I don't think he trusted Cutler in those situations just yet. So, you know, Miami didn't look great offensively. They did on defense. But... um. And this is supposed to be a short blurb, so I'm just going to say, you know, San Diego looked exactly like the team I thought they were. They're good enough to compete. They're not good enough to win. Um, you've got the Jets at the Raiders. Yeah, really quick on this game. Um, the Raiders did what they had to do in this game. They beat the bad teams. Uh, it was close, uh, up, right up until halftime, where... Uh, there was a turnover inside the five-yard line, and the Raiders never looked back. So, you beat the bad teams. You don't give them any sense of uh, false hope that they can stay in and win a game. You put that team away. You make it. You put them away as early as you can, and you move on to the next week. Sure, you watch some tape, but Marshawn ran well. He got, he got the uh, rust knocked off of him in week one. Ran well, and, and Carr to Crabtree was just lethal. They're, they had no answer for, for Crabtree in that game. It, it's going to be it's going to be a, a fun offense to watch. Uh, it's their defense. Um, I mean, they get a point of the Jets. You know, ten of uh, I think ten in each half. But they they got to shore up a little bit of their defense, and yeah. and they can they can definitely go far. All right, go in depth on this one. You wanted to Dallas at Denver. All right, Dallas at Denver was an entertaining game if you actually decided to stick through the lightning uh, uh, delay uh, that uh, that happened. Um, it was a very entertaining game uh, for the Denver side of the ball. Trevor Simeon has improved so much uh, from last year to this year. It's ridiculous. Four touchdown passes. I said on the show last week that Denver's defense is going to make uh, – uh, Dak Prescott can throw the ball, and they did, without much success. Um, and I mentioned that uh, uh, Tom Brady had two carries for nine yards. Well, I'm going to give you another uh, stat. Ezekiel Elliott, nine carries, eight yards. So Tom Brady outrushed last year's leading rusher. By a yard, but he still did it. Yeah. It, they they only gave the ball to Elliott nine times to run. Now, something's wrong with that. Brandon, I know you're down, but what Elliott was able to do uh, last year, you'd think that they'd be able to keep doing it this year, yeah. running the ball. But, you know, that's what happens when your wide receivers like Bryant and Terrence Williams get no separation from the Denver corners. So you, you chalk this up to a huge Denver win both sides of the ball. They, they played they played great. And I was really impressed with the way Denver played. Yeah, I was too. I was the only one to pick them, though. You picked Dallas, just so you know. I picked Dallas. Yeah, I've been did. wrong before. Yeah. yeah, this week you were. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, San Francisco, Seattle. So Eric tells me, you know, we're LA Rams Central. We should probably cover the NFC West team. So why don't you cover the NFC West teams, which allows me on some weeks, to only get one extra game while he gets all the cool ones. I get how he's doing it. I know what he's doing. I'm on to you, Eric. 
but that's fine. I'll do that. I'll do that for the fans. That's fair. So San Francisco at Seattle. Um, like, un okay, so let me explain something to you. There were three games this week. Buffalo at Carolina, Kansas City at Philadelphia, and this game, where they were really low-scoring games. The Carolina-Buffalo game at times was really difficult to watch. At no time was the Kansas City-Philadelphia game difficult to watch. And at no time was this game difficult to watch. You had Hyde running all over a defense that I told you guys in the beginning of the year that Pete Carroll gets lazy. He's gotten lazy. It's been proven now this year. Over two games, he's been gassed by a running game from a suspect football team in Green Bay that can't run the ball and a bad football team in the San Francisco 49ers. Their offensive line can't block anybody. They can't even and forget, you know, they can't even block a cold from coming into their home. I mean, they're terrible. You know, you've got Russell Wilson on offense, and you've got, well, you've got Russell Wilson on offense and no one else. And then on defense, you've got a unit that's been told they're wonderful for so long that now they're believing it and they're playing like the 89 Chicago Bear defense. Good football players underachieving all over the place. Even still, they were able to lock down a very bad 49er football team. But it took a ridiculous Russell Wilson play to win the game. Now I'm looking at Seattle and I said they were going to be bad. I said Arizona was going to be, um, you know, the, uh, Arizona was going to be good. Both these teams that are supposedly going to compete with the Rams in the NFC West look awful this year. They haven't even shown flashes of looking good yet. San Francisco is who we thought they were. Good football team, as far as scheme, do not have the players to execute it yet. And when Hoyer's your quarterback, you might as well put 10 guys in the box because Hoyer ain't going to complete a pass to a wide open wide receiver, let alone a covered one. So I'm looking at this situation. I'm thinking to myself, the 49ers have some really nice pieces in place in their D-line, their, their linebacker, who, by the way, he's out this week, Foster. They can build, and they're going to be a good team, and I have no doubt the Niners will return one day. And this was a really good game for the 49ers. Listen to me, Niner fans. I know you lost. I know you're 0-2, and I know you're probably pissed off because you think you should have won. You should have. But the fact that you were able to play this good is a good thing. And if I'm a Seahawk fan, I'm, I'm, crapping my, I'm wearing my crapping pants every week. Because I'm just waiting for the cape, for the roof to cave in. This is not a good football team right now. And they have a lot of open and obvious holes to the rest of the nation watching. And it's, it's bad news when you're a coach and your biggest problem is your offensive line. So I'm not impressed with Seattle. I thought San Francisco played well. But this was, again, it's, I'm sorry to say, but it was two bad teams playing and it looked like it. But... It was a smash mouth football game, and it had some exciting moments, some big sacks, some big hits, some drop passes. It was enjoyable to watch, considering it's two teams I can't stand, and I like those low-scoring games. But Seattle looked exactly as I thought they would look this year. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on this one, and then you go into detail on the Monday night game. Green Bay at Atlanta. Um, all I'm going to say here is this was the game for me that was going to tell me a lot about where the Atlanta Falcons are going to end up this year. I, as everyone knows, I picked them to go to the Super Bowl. And for me, you have to win against playoff caliber teams at home. And you have to win against playoff caliber teams on the road if you're going to be a Super Bowl champion. We'll see what week three holds. But this was a big measuring stick for the Falcons and where they are right now. Big win. A blowout win. I don't care if the score got close at the end. It was a blowout win. And at no point was I sitting there going, uh-oh. Are they going to blow it? Like, I knew Atlanta was going to lock it down. I just didn't know at what point. So, big win for Atlanta. Um, making me look like a genius right now, and I appreciate that. But the Falcons look as good as I thought they would look against a Green Bay team that I think was a little overrated. And I think they were a little um, overblown after the Seahawks win, as I said they would be. And we'll see how this unfolds. Do you have any thoughts on that, E? You know, the Monday night, or the Sunday night game, excuse me, I like the way uh, Atlanta's defense pressured Rodgers. They were in his face the majority of the night. Uh, two turnovers in the first half really changed the game. One fumble return for a touchdown. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Green Bay, again, they, they, they try to keep their defense in there um, and keep them in the game. But, you know, when you're down uh, two receivers, uh, one in the first half and one in the second half, Nelson went out with a quad injury and, and uh, uh, Cobb went out too, uh, it, it, it's hard to keep up, especially with an offense like Atlanta. Um, I mean, hey, Falcons didn't want to open up their new stadium all at one, and I don't blame them. So they did whatever they could to get that to get that win. And, you know, they played a hard fought game. They did. And, you know, Jones looked good early on. Um, you know, Atlanta went run heavy toward the end uh, to run the clock out. But you know, the Falcons, the Falcons got a couple of. Uh, I don't want to say easy games, but they got they got a couple of winnable games to start the year, and they had another NFC North team coming up uh, this week. But uh, you know they they're they're the team in the NFC everybody's running for. Mm-hmm. I will say this: if I'm a Falcon fan, I'm a little pissed off because I'm like, why didn't you guys do that in the Super Bowl? Damn it, run the ball as much as you did at the end. Uh, you wanted for some unknown reason, you wanted to touch on Detroit and New York. Go. Yeah, yeah, I was actually um, really interested in this game. I picked the Giants, and uh, I don't think I'm ever going to pick the Giants again. I told you that earlier, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But uh, I liked the way the Lions came up running the football. They called, this is no joke, they called four passes in the second half. Four. This is how much they wanted to establish the run, how much they wanted the Giants to stop them and not... And I, I think they went in there saying, you know, Stanford cannot throw the ball 40 times. And he did. Um, I was really impressed. Uh, Abdullah had 86 yards of rushing. Um, you know, it looked like the Giants were lost from the from the start of the snap. Um, the Lions just played a great game offensively and defensively. Gave offensive, quarter, uh, offensive coordinator Jim Bob Cooter a lot of credit for this game. He came in with a plan, he stuck to it. And and, and Detroit ended up winning by uh, by two touchdowns. Uh, I read I read a very interesting article that um, that uh, Ben McAdoo put a lot of blame on Eli Manning for getting a delay of game penalty, uh, fourth and goal, uh, when they were about to go when he scored, went from I want to say from the two yard line to the seven yard line, uh, somewhere between the seven and nine yard line, so it changed the whole dynamic of the uh, play and the call. Uh, they they just look out of sync. Um, you know, I'm going to have to take back my giant Super Bowl pick here very soon. <laughs> That's right. The, you decided uh, to be a smart one on that. The Giants. The Giants. I don't know. Uh, they are. I don't know if it's because Odell's hurt. Obviously, one player shouldn't have to make that offense go. They have no run game. Uh, Brandon Marshall is non-existent, so I'm waiting for him to tear the tear the roof off the locker room. Um, you know, Vereen's not even getting involved as their uh, pass catching uh, running back. Sterling Shepard has caught six passes in, in in two games, and he was a he was he had a great rookie season. Yeah. So you know, maybe if Eli would actually feed. Uh, his players some of the some of the passes. They they might actually be able to move the ball. But well, New York just looks not as sick. I know what the problem with New York is. Are you ready? Go ahead. Okay. Ben McAdoo. Ben McAdoo is the problem. Uh, I mean, Ben McAdoo is the same coordinator two years ago in Coughlin's final year that thought it was a great idea to throw a pass on third and goal from the one when they had the lead against the Dallas Cowboys as time was expiring. Jim Bob Cooter is the one that thought it was a good idea to call a timeout while the other team was trying to hurry up and spike the football because they had no more timeouts trying to get into field goal range at one point that same season, costing the Giants the football game. He was the one that hurriedly told his... uh, That was last year. Sorry, that was last year. So, I mean... He is exactly what he is. He's, he's going to throw the ball 45, 50 times a game. He could, he could have a 1,000-yard rusher at the end of the first quarter, and he will never touch the ball again. Um, it's just that's what, that's what Ben McAdoo is. He is as bad as his haircut was a year ago. And if you didn't see it, Google it. 
because it was horrendous. So anyway, that's my two cents. Rams, Redskins. I'm a little pissed at myself. If you go back to one of our episodes, I want to say it was episode 46 or it might have been 43 when we did the schedule release. We had the Rams going 2-2 two and two to start the year. Beating Indy, losing to Washington, beating San Fran, and losing to Dallas. And I got a little too excited over that Ram-Colt game. There's a reason the Rams lost this game. And when you look at it and you go, yeah, but Anthony, we gave up 229 yards rushing. How often are we going to do that? You're right. But that's the problem is we're not there yet. We're good enough to win our division. We're good enough to make the postseason. I don't think we're good enough to win a playoff game unless we get a really favorable draw. And that's just luck of the, luck of the draw at that point. I think this football team still is missing a lot of key pieces. And right now, I'm going to point this loss on our outside linebackers right now. Because their inability in Robert Quinn and Connor Barwin to contain the outside and prevent them from get, you know, getting to the outside really hurt us in the first half. And I was really disappointed in how we played run defense because we were that afraid of Kirk Cousins, and it showed, um, and with good reason, because I do, unlike everyone else apparently, I do think Kirk Cousins is a really good quarterback, and those weapons are going to click at some point. But man, if Washington can run... I, look, I'm going to say two things on this game real quick. Their offensive line, the Redskins, that's what I want us to be. I mean, they were blowing open holes. Aaron Donald was getting owned. At one point, Aaron Donald was blocked so severely out of the play that he took out Robert Quinn, freeing the guy up. The guy, dude blocked two people with one block. Like, we need to get there. We're not there yet. What I did like... And what I'm excited about and why I'm like not walking away from this game completely pissed off is we were down 13-0. A year ago, the final score to that game would have been 34-3. It absolutely would have blown us out of the water. We would have given up, tanked up, said, see you later, we can't score, we're done. Instead, this year, they kept with it. They showed that they could come back. They tied the game at the end. And then Kirk drives them up the field and wins the game. We have an opportunity to, to tie it again in force overtime. And that was a horrendous pick by Jared Goff. You don't eye down your receiver. Like that's quarterbacking 101. You learn that in Pop Warner. And while it's easy to remember not to do that in college, when you're in the pros and it's a big moment, you do that. That was about the most anticlimactic ending to a football game I think I've seen in a long, long time. And it was devastating. And I was frustrated. Because that's a mistake Goff cannot make in year two. But it's understandable that he makes that mistake early in year two. I just don't want to see these mistakes continue throughout the, se out throughout the season. Because by, mid by midseason, that's a mistake that should rarely, if ever, happen again. But credit the Redskins. They shoved it down our throat. They force-fed the pigskin down our, gallet, down, down our gullet. And then they made us crap it out of our rear end. And then reshoved it down our throat. And I hate to say that because, trust me, my wife is a Redskins fan. I'm not going to hear the end of this until they play again in two or three years. So this was a very bitter pill to swallow. Okay, To give you an idea what I had to deal with, my wife got in a Redskin garb and played Hail to the Redskins five times while dancing in front of me, making me watch her. Which, hey, I don't mind watching my wife dance. I'm just going to say that right now. But that's besides the point. It didn't do well when we just lost the game. And I'm like, really? You're going to do this right now? You're going to gloat? She's like, yeah. How many people picked the Redskins? No one, Eric. No one on the network except for Cynthia with her analytics. But the Rams lost this game, but the Redskins also won it. And there's a lesson to be learned here because we've got another great running, gap, running back or another good running game, I should say, coming up this week. Your takeaway. You know, what concerned me uh, was watching the Redskins run through the Rams' defense. Yes. And I was like, and I was watching it saying, um, isn't the Rams' run defense supposed to be one of the, one of the strongest units? Uh, Aaron Donald came back. I was excited to watch him. He 
he made he made one of the most aggressive non plays that I've ever seen from a defensive lineman. He was in the backfield and almost picked off a pass as it was being um, tossed back to the running back. It was, it was just insane how quickly he got through. Yeah. Um, Goff still has his growing pains. That's to be expected. Uh, he's he's got to limit the turnovers at the most crucial times. You know, turnovers are going to happen, but it's when they happen that could be uh, drive uh, game killing. Uh, you know, Mason Rudolph picked him off late in the fourth quarter, basically sealed the uh, sealed the game for the for the Redskins. Um, you know, if the, if the Rams come out playing and, and don't get themselves into that thirteen nothing hole, that's a different game. Yeah. Um, again, it, it's it's all a learning curve. Um, they'll be there. Uh, I, I think he's going to be a great coach. Um, those close games, you got to win, and that's that's what's going to propel the Rams to go from below 500 to 500 to playoffs. Yeah, uh, that could happen as early as this year. That could be as early as next year. Um, but I think they just got a little bit of work to do. Uh, they just have to be able to contain uh, a running plays, not like too early. You know, golf will golf will shine. Just give them time. Oh, I will. And I will. The and fans know we will. Yeah, it, it, it's one game that's early in the season, and there's a there's a lot to be learned from this game. So I was I was actually kind of happy because I texted you, Anthony. I said, "Hey, um, I get the Rams game because the uh, weather delay in Denver." So I was actually excited to watch what was going on in LA um, to be able to you know discuss what was going to you know go on in the show. Yeah. And you know the Redskins, the Redskins had a good bounce back game. Uh, they could have easily lost that, obviously. Um, uh, like I said, it's, it's a learning curve for the Rams, and uh, they they got a big game tomorrow night uh, against the against the Niners. You know, always throw records out, mm-hmm. but when those two teams face each other, um, so they'll be they'll be looking to bounce back, well, uh, and I think they will. But yeah, I, you I, know, I, it, it's one of those games where it, if only they could have stopped one or two uh, third down run, Chris Thompson. Chris Thompson was a beast in that game, too. Yeah. Uh, he was just weaving in and out of the Rams secondary and scored a touchdown. Um, you know, I, I um, it's one of those losses. It's it's in the conference, which you don't want, but it's it's not a division loss, and it's not – it's a loss at home in the conference, which hurts for wild card purposes. But with as bad as the NFC West looks this year, I'm less concerned about that loss than I would be if, say, it was against – you know, obviously a division opponent. Um, the sure. Niners, the, the, the Redskins were not going to lose this game. I mean, at least they played like they weren't planning on it. They were desperate to win it, and they really showed up. And they were a proud bunch, and I'll give them that. Real quick on the picks. We did pretty well this week, Eric. Uh, the experts, quote-unquote, on the NFL Network, uh, a lot of 12-4 and four records. I tied a lot of them. Um, you came in at 11-5, and five, which was right there at the top of, of – uh, the experts picking on the NFL network. We both did better than Elliot Harrison did. Um, you know, so we obviously know what we're doing and we're obviously good at this because we're right there with these guys that are on TV that are considered quote unquote experts. I want to jump into our week three picks and we'll do this quickly. Baltimore at Jacksonville. I'll say a quick blurb. You say a quick blurb and I mean quick blurb like 20 seconds. Baltimore at Jacksonville. Ravens defense looks really good right now. Jacksonville has a great running game. We will find out how good Fournette is, but I think the Ravens ultimately win. Yeah, Ravens defense too much for Jacksonville, especially uh, well, they're they're actually playing in uh, in London. Uh, oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. It's like Jacksonville's second home, so yeah. Uh, Baltimore, Baltimore, safely defense. Baltimore wins. Yeah, Denver at Buffalo. Um, look, I'm still waiting for Buffalo to get blown out. Um, and I'm not going to have to wait any longer. They can run the ball. They can throw the ball. They play great defense. Man, if you're a Bronco fan, you're celebrating a 3-0 and start because this is a, almost a gimme win. I'm going Denver in a route. Yeah, I'm going Denver. I think it'll be a little closer than a route. Um, Two touchdowns. Eric, Eric, real, real quick. I'm, I'm, They've given up. They've given up. 86 yards rushing in two games. I understand that. So, C.J. Anderson C.J. Anderson is going to have a tough time, but Denver's got too many weapons on the outside, so that's why Denver wins. Denver wins by 14 points. I, I go with that. 
Okay. That's a blowout. Well, it's a medium game, right? It's more of a medium score. Would you agree? Yeah, me too. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Uh, New Orleans at Carolina. I'm going to go with New Orleans. I'm kidding. I'm going to go with Carolina in this one. Um, Carolina scares me because they don't have a lot of offense. But as the NFL, as Kurt Warner said last week on the NFL Network, when you, or Michael Irvin said this, which I thought was funny, and it actually was funny. Whenever you are ill on offense, take two New Orleans Saints defenses and call me in the morning. This is going to be a Carolina win. You there? Uh, oh. I think Carolina's defense keeps, uh, keeps the game a little scoring and that favors Carolina. Yeah. Pittsburgh at Chicago. This is the final game for Mike Glennon. Pittsburgh in a route. There will be no reason not to do the Trubisky Road Show and see if that freak show is actually going to turn into a wonderful event or if it's going to be a utter and complete disaster. Pittsburgh wins this one by three touchdowns. Well, you got half of that right. Pittsburgh does win in a route, but, uh, but Trubisky doesn't start week four because it's a short week. They're going to Green Bay. Look for Trubisky to start week eight. Or, I'm sorry, not week eight, week five. Fair enough. Not at home against Minnesota. Uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh routes the Bears easily. I'll be there, so I don't know who to root for uh, since they're my two favorite teams. Obviously, Bears first, but we all know where the Bears are headed this year. Who cares? You root for your home team, your favorite team. That's why you have a one and a two, oh, dude. Relax yourself. I'm wearing my Walter Payton jersey. Yeah, you better. I bought it for you. All right. I almost put you down for the Bears, dude. I'm sorry. Um, Atlanta at Detroit. Look, um, if they're going to win the Super Bowl this year, they need to go into Detroit and beat them. I said September was going to be crucial. Um, we would know where Pitts, where Atlanta would be by the end of September. They win this game. It's going to be close, though. It might come down to a Matt Ryan driving the Falcons up the field for the game winner, um, whether it be a field goal or a touchdown. But because I do have that much respect for Stafford, but the Falcons do win this football game. Too many weapons. Uh, Atlanta, too much offensive firepower. You know, Detroit needs to be able to run the football, and I don't think they'll be able to establish a run against the uh, Falcons uh, front seven. So. Uh, give me the Falcons by 10. Nice. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, three or less. Um, look, Cleveland at Indy, I'm, I'm actually going to watch this game, just so you know. So this will be my extra game that I cover, if you will. I'm watching this one. Um, Kaiser's Why? been – Because, uh, you know what? They're a young football team, are the Browns. They've, they've had two really difficult opponents to open up the season defensively. They finally get a defense that they can actually open up and play against and not have to worry about it being loaded from top to bottom in talent. So we can really get an official look at what Kaiser's going to do this year. We can see what kind of a running back Crowell is really going to be. And you know what? Anytime you can watch Joe Thomas dominate the left side of the line, it's worth the ticket of admission. I like the Browns. I've always liked the Browns. This, for me, is the first game of the regular season for Cleveland. We finally get to see what kind of team they really are. Because you know something? The Colts proved I was right after week one. They're not a Pop Warner team. They're just not a very good team. They're about comparable. And I think this game is going to be fun to watch. I'm picking the Browns to win. But I think it's going to be, it could be another overtime game. It could be another, you know, late touchdown game, whatever. But I'm watching it. I'm glued. It's must-see TV for me, at least. Because I like watching these teams that don't get a lot of coverage that have promising things in the future. And I think Jacoby Brissett is a decent quarterback. So it should, I mean, he's not great, but he's decent. I think it's going to be a fun game to watch. So Cleveland wins in a close one. My head does Cleveland because I want one less team to have zero wins. So Bears going to top three six. Uh, but my head, my heart says I got to go with Indy. I don't think Cleveland wins this game. They're both bad teams. It's going to be a bad game. We'll see. You may have to eat crow next week. Tampa Bay at Minnesota. I still think the Buccaneers are a bad football team. But let me tell you, not a bad football team. I don't think they're a playoff football team yet. I think they're getting there. But you know something? 
I'm in your boat. My heart is telling me, go with Tampa Bay. My head is telling me, Case Keenum lit them up in Tampa Bay a year ago. Lit them up. And he's got a good defense again. So, I'm going to go with an upset. For now. Uh, who's quarterbacking the Vikings? If it's Case Keenum, I just said he beat Tampa last year with the L.A. Rams. Okay. So if Case Keenum starts again, Tampa. If Brad, uh, Brad, uh, Bradford starts, give me the Vikings. Okay, well, let's assume right now you can text me like you did before. Make a pick. Make a pick? Yeah, make uh, a pick. All of the cases are Case Keenum starting. Um, so I'm going with Tampa. Okay. Like I said, like I said, I agree. There's a lot of weapons, but the Viking Case Keenum isn't playing defense. So, and they shut down Antonio Brown. So I'm going with the Vikings at home. Houston at New England. I think the Patriots beat Houston in a route. They're not going to lose two weeks in a uh, row. I agree. They're not going to lose at home twice. But they at home, they, uh, New England doesn't want to suffer another home loss. Definitely not. They'd be in the hole if they did that. Um, Miami at New England at New York. Uh, the Jets. I'm picking Miami. I, I don't. I think Cutler goes two and zero. Oh. I don't think that the Jets are going to be in the game enough for a pick six to matter. So even if he does throw one, it's not going to hurt him. <laughs> uh, this might, it might be two teams in a row where Cutler doesn't throw a pick. So uh, give me the Dolphins. All right. There we go. Uh, Giants at Philly. Uh, originally on this, I was thinking I was probably going to pick Philly anyway at home and have the two split home and home. But at this point, the Giants are so bad. Philly wins this one, and it's going to be the Carson Wentz show. Yeah, I told you I wasn't picking the Giants again. So yeah, there we Philly. go. Seattle at Tennessee. Another one I'm watching. Um, Titans are going to win this one by twelve by ten points or more. Um, they can run the ball, and um, trust me, their running backs, I think, are a little bit better than Carlos Hyde. Their offensive line is way better than the 49ers, and their defense is a lot better than San Francisco's. The Seahawks have a major problem on their hands. I'm picking the Titans to win this game by 10 points or more. Yeah, um, Seattle's defense kept them in the game in Week 1 at Green Bay. Uh, held about a touchdown. Um, they barely escaped a win at home against San Francisco. They've scored only one touchdown this season, and it was with uh, a broken hand by their wide receiver, Paul Richardson, which was amazing. He was still able to catch it, but give me the Titans. I think it's going to be uh, by about 17 or more. Okay, I rarely do this. I rarely do this. Are you ready? I'm calling it. This next game goes into overtime. But, because I think it's going to be, you're going to see a different team take the field that we've seen the first two weeks. But ultimately, the Green Bay Packers will beat the Cincinnati Bengals. But watch, it's going to be an OT game. Now I may be the one eating crow. Yeah, I don't know where Cincinnati's offense is coming from. But, no. No. No, this game's over at halftime. All right, fair enough. We both picked Green Bay, so it doesn't really matter. I'm just going for the extra little sauce on that. Kansas City at the San Diego Chargers. I'm sorry. I meant to say the Oakland Chargers. Um, Kansas City wins this game. Blowout City in Diego. Um, I think the Chiefs are for real. And this is an opponent on the road, division opponent. They have to win this game. Yeah, uh... Chargers may stay into it for about three quarters of the game, but Kansas City is going to be too tough defensively. Uh, I like Kansas City by at least six. Yeah, I mean, and that would be a blowout for the Chargers because I will give the Chargers credit. That football team doesn't get blown out. If you beat them by six points or more, seven points or more, that's almost like a blowout it feels like because they seem to be in every single game no matter the opponent. Um, Oakland at Washington, I think we're going to have our first official split here. 
I don't believe Michael Crabtree can do two good games in a row together. He didn't do it at all last year or the year before, and trust me, I know I had him on my fantasy team. He never puts up back-to-back good numbers. He gives you a good number, a crooked number on the board, and then the next week he barely shows up. Josh Norman's going to be on Amari Cooper all day, every day. So Crabtree's going to have his opportunity. But Sue Cravitz comes back, and the Redskins are not the New York Jets. This is a good football team that I do think really salvaged some stuff with that Week 2 win over L.A. They can run the ball. They proved that. And Cousins has a whole other week to fine-tune his skills. And they're at home. Super Bowl 18 rematch. But I just, I'm just i looking at this logically, and I'm saying – Oakland's not going 16-0. This is a game they may be taken by surprise. The Redskins held Gurley to 85 yards. Beast mode is a whole different animal. But they've got the secondary. They can come up and hit, and they certainly can cover. I'm going, I'm going with the Redskins in this one in a close one. by a touchdown. Wow. Okay. All right. Dallas at Arizona. Um, Really, we only disagreed on one game, Eric. The only game we disagreed on, because technically if Bradford does play, and there's no reason he shouldn't, except his knee is made of jello. Um, If he plays, you're picking the Vikings. I pick the Vikings. This is the only one we made that we disagreed on, and I have a feeling it's going to be the only game we disagree on, so our entire week may come down to one game. But Dallas at Arizona... The Cardinals are that bad, and the Cowboys are mad as Hades. Dallas is going to win this game in Arizona 28-16. Wow. Uh, even with the score and everything. Yeah, well, uh, we, got, we got to do the score on Monday night. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think you see Ezekiel run wild. Uh, 31-13 Cowboys. Wow. They have a lot to prove after uh, last week's dismantling in Denver. Yeah, I, I just don't see the Cardinals scoring more than 16 points this week against that defense, and I, I do think that the San Francisco that the San Francisco, that the Dallas Cowboys are, are are a very angry bunch of guys, and I do think that that line is prideful. They're one of the be- the best line in football, and I think they're going to blow open some holes and make a statement loud and clear. Not in the NFC. I don't care if we're on the road or not. We're winning this game. I agree. Okay, Rams at 49ers. So we're going to do our breakdown here, and then we'll do our rant, and then we'll be done. My breakdown is pretty simple. I said last week the Rams had to run the ball. 85 yards is a good start, but it's not what the Rams needed. If Gurley had rushed for 100 yards in that game, the Rams are in more scoring position opportunities, and they probably at least are in a position where they can win the game. They still were in a position where they could tie it, and maybe it doesn't make it make a difference. The Rams did run the ball better against a very good football team, in my opinion, and they showed that, the, that it's coming. In order to beat the San Francisco 49ers, this is what has to happen. Todd Gurley needs to find a way to get to 100 yards rushing. Okay? And with no DeForest, or with no uh, Foster, and a couple of, I think they're missing a corner too, a safety. They're missing two key guys on that defense. This offensive line is getting better each week. It's short rest. You're not going to change your game plan too much. The Rams need to run the ball between the tackles more. Forget trying to go outside. I'm saying it right now, Eric. They need to forget about Tavon Austin. Every time that guy gets the football, it's a wasted damn down. Get him off the field until the second half when the defense is tired. Then use his speed, quote-unquote, which I'm yet to see, and try to get to the outside. But don't use this guy in the first half. Use him in the second. It's got to be Todd Gurley between the tackles and Jared Goff must be at least 50% on third down conversions. If he does that and the defense shows up and does their gap responsibility and they contain the edge, the Rams will route San Francisco. If any one of those three keys break down, this is going to be a problem for Los Angeles. 
They've got to find a way to stay on the field so their defense is rested dealing with a running back like and, and a running game like San Francisco. And they absolutely need to find a way to find a running game on their own. 85 is a nice beginning, but I want to see 185 yards rushing. I don't want to see 85 yards rushing. I don't expect Gurley to break away. Everyone thinks he's Eric Dickerson. I'm sorry, he's Lawrence McCutcheon, and I said he was Lawrence McCutcheon from day one when we drafted him. He's even got the same number, guys, number 30. Lawrence McCutcheon was a power runner who had good speed. Not great speed, but good speed. He can get you the long run against the slower football team. And maybe San Francisco is. But what he's good at is getting the chunk play. The 20-yard completion, the 30-yard completion, the 30-yard run, the 20-yard run. When it's there, he will get caught from behind. But then he'll plow his way into the end zone like we've seen the last two weeks. He is Lawrence McCutcheon reincarnate. And we need to start utilizing him in that way. And we are in the passing game. And we are in the running game. But we need to start running the ball a little bit more than 19 to 22 times a game. I want to see him get it 25 to 30 times a game and let Goff do his third down magic and let Cup find the crease and get the big play action pass for a big gain on third and you know short or even second and short or maybe even first and 10. And we need to utilize Sammy Watkins more. And there's a lot of what's a lot of things that we need to do here, but it really for me comes down to three things. Run the rock, convert third and short or third downs, at least 50% of them and contain the edge, and do your gap responsibilities on defense. And th those two are, are in one category for the defense. If the Rams do that, they're going to be fine. That's my analysis for this week. What's yours? Well, I think you basically covered everything. But uh, mine is, you know, like I said earlier, um, Aaron Donald coming back, knocking the rust off in, in week two. I think you're going to see a, a big difference in him this week as well. Um, pressure Brian Hoyer, create turnovers, and do not let uh, Carlos Hyde get to 100 yards rushing. Uh, I mean, the only guy you really have to worry about catching passes is Pierre Garçon. Um, yeah. But take care of the football on the offensive side. And, and run early. Um, you know, get get Cup involved early. Get Watkins involved early. Uh, it should be it should be uh, 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 cruise to an easy victory. Uh, I, I don't see the Rams, unless, unless they completely, like, not show up. I don't see the Rams losing this game. Yeah, I don't know. There's no way they can lose this game. I know what happened last year in week one against the Niners. Everybody remembers that. But, and it, it is a completely different Rams team, so there's no comparison. Yeah. Uh, but again, as I said before, throw out all the records when these two teams meet. Uh, you, know, the, you know the 49ers are going to come to play? It's the Rams' job to take them out early, especially... I don't expect to sell out tomorrow night because the 49ers are that bad. Yeah. Uh, but take the, take the crowd out of it really early. Don't look back. Yeah, I agree. I think the Rams win this game by two, two maybe 17 points or two touchdowns. Take your pick. All right, Eric, quickly. Um, I'm going to go on a rant. So you texted me today and you said, did you know that Sammy Watkins thinks the earth is flat? I'm going to say this very carefully to everyone out there. Don't let your kids go to Clemson. They get dumber for going to Clemson, apparently, or Duke. Here's the deal. This is free advice to everyone out there. From now on, when you meet somebody new or somebody decides they want to have a conversation with you and they're like, hey, how you doing? I like the hat, dude. The first question you ask them is, it, the first thing you do, is it, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. You're a Ram fan too? Cool. No, no, no. Stop right there. Put the wall up and say, is the earth round or flat? Because their answer is going to depend on whether or not you need to waste oxygen on that person. If you believe the earth is flat, you can unsubscribe. I don't care. But do everyone a favor and kill yourself. All right? There's oxygen old people could use that you are wasting. Okay? We don't need you on this planet. You're too dumb to live. You really are. Like, we have science for a reason, folks. And I'm sorry... That a guy on our football team doesn't believe dinosaurs existed last year, and now this idiot, no wonder the Bills traded him. They were like, yeah. my, my head's exploding. Like, I'm not a Watkins fan, but I'm not a Watkins hater. But if what you said is true, I have no use for that person. It is a waste of DNA and human flesh. Like, 
You have no purpose on this planet but to take up space and bother us. Go away. It, it bugs me that much because systematically we're saying certain things in science don't matter and then using science to prove other political opinions. I'm not going to get into politics, but other political beliefs and opinions that we have. So it's whenever science is convenient is when you decide to use it. Okay? The earth is round. Buy a book. I know at Clemson you probably don't get them, and the football team certainly doesn't recommend you use them because they're all idiots. But get a book. Just, you know what? Look at a satellite image. It's not hard, people. It's round. That's my rant. You go, E. All right. Well, it's only been two weeks, but it's only been a few years. But uh, the in-game former officials, Jerry Austin, Team Blandino, and who's the other guy on Fox, Anthony? Oh, God, what's his name? Pereira. Yes, Mike Pereira. Thank you. Yep. They have got to go. Get them out of the booth. Get them out of the center in Los Angeles or wherever they're housed. Get them out. And I have a perfect example if you watch the Monday night game. Eli Manning drops back to pass. He gets sacked. Ball comes out. Whistle not, does not blow. The Lions uh, pick it up, return it for a touchdown. They kept playing. They didn't hear the whistle. They did what you're taught to do. Okay? So they go to replay. Obviously, there's all turnovers and scoring it, it is reviewed. Right. So they go to replay. As they're talking to Jerry Austin, the replay sl sh uh, slows down. Manning has the football. His knee is on the ground. Okay? Which would mean... Uh, play is dead. Jerry Austin says, oh, watching this uh, replay, there is no way that this can be overturned. Official gets, uh, gets out from off the headset. After review of the play, the play is reversed. What are you watching? No kidding. Are right? you watching the game? Apparently not. No. I cannot think of a waste of time for former officials to be on TV because, oh, they, they, they rep the game. So they can give us insight on on fumbles. Because Sherry Austin even said, as as the replay was going, oh, you could see a little bobble in there. You know, I watched the replay about five times. There ain't no little bobble. Well, Eric, if, so, you, if you want to know why attend they, if you want to know why attendance is low in Cincinnati, why attendance is low in Cleveland, why attendance is low in Los Angeles, why attendance is low in San Francisco, why attendance is low in, yes, I dare say it, even Chicago. It's not because the teams are bad. It's because the tickets are outrageous and people are, being tired, are getting tired of being told they're dumb. The reason they have these officials on the TV is because the average fan apparently is too stupid to know the difference between what's a fumble and what isn't what's a catch and what isn't, when all actuality the problem is and has always been the officiating. They don't know what the hell it is, and they cause the problems. No, they don't. They don't. They, they don't even know the old, they don't even know the rule book. No. Yet, I can, sit, I, I can sit on my TV and I can rep a game myself and probably do 95% better than these guys who are actually there. Dude. And, 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 and they're talking these full-time referees. How can you be full-time if... You work from preseason to Super Bowl. That's 26 weeks. That ain't full time. Well, That's one day a week. That ain't full time. Here, here's, here's the other issue, E. I, I, two weeks in a row, three or four times through the course of a game, I'm like, false start. Guy moved before the ball was snapped. No flag. No flag. I'm like, you don't see the giant 360-pound human being backpedaling on a pass play before the ball is snapped? Like, you missed it. Somehow. You missed it. Like, it's hard not to notice. I saw it in the Philly game. I saw it in the Redskin Ram game. I saw it in the Redskin Eagle game. Notice the pattern there now that I think about it. But putting that aside, like, it was obvious. And I got so angry last week in 
in the Redskin game when it happened that I like went on a 10 minute tirade about how the hell you missed that call. Like they're not even catching that. I, I ask you guys, fans, watch. I want you to comment next week, this week, comment. Okay. Before I do the show on Wednesday of next week, we do the show on Wednesday of next week. I want you to comment how many times you saw a false start not get called. Because so far, I'm up to six. And we've only had two weeks. I'm serious, E. You're right. It, it, it's just, it's like, it, it's seriously like every time that there's a replay, oh, well, let's go to Mike Pereira in Los Angeles. No. It's like going to a sideline reporter at halftime and saying, hey, do you, are you happy with how your team did? You're going to get a yes or no. It's, the, it's seriously the, the most worthless position during and after a game yeah. that I can think of. Yeah. It's, you could save a lot of you're money gonna, right there. You're going to get a bland answer. You're going to get nothing. You're right. You're right. All right. Well, guys, that's it. We were hoping to get this show at 45 minutes. Eric, we failed miserably. Um, it's an hour and 11 minutes plus. So we hope you guys enjoyed our review. We'll try to get this faster. We're a work in progress. I think it was a good show. LA Rams Central, 51st episode on behalf of Anthony. And go ahead, E. And Eric. We want to say thank you very much. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. And go Rams!